Hello and welcome to the heart of Fiat Crucified Love. This week we're going to talk about Polish saints. I am 100% Polish, although when I recently did my DNA, I found out I'm just about 98% Polish. I've got a handful of Russian in me. Um, even you can trace my genealogy back to the area of Siberia where I served, which is interesting. Um, and I've got a little bit of Ethiopian, of African in me, and a little bit of Lebanese, um, kind of unlike my siblings. So you can see how being a missionary is in my DNA, right? I got those genes from all over the world. But most of my blood is Polish, and I was raised in a very Polish Catholic family, and I have a great love for Poland, and um, I feel a natural affinity um, in a motherly way towards Our Lady of Czestochowa, that she is here like our mother. And I have here a copy of an icon I painted of her, the originals in my parents' house, um, and then a statue of her that my parents got for each one of us several years ago at Christmas. And I'm gonna be talking about the different um, saints that um, have come from Poland. Obviously not all of them because the list goes on and on, but some of the better known ones. But um, the kind of common theme um, of all of these saints is a devotion to Our Lady and for most of them particularly under the title of Our Lady of Czesnachowa, um, in Yajna Gora is the name of the, the shrine um, where she is kept and she has been there for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, so a love to her is something that runs through each one of their lives in a different way. Some more strongly and others more faintly, but she definitely has her handprint on them. So at the beginning here, I thought I would sing, it's actually my favorite Polish song, but it's called Miriam. And it's to Our Lady with her name, um, which is Miriam, right? And it's pray for me, Mary, um, that your son would live in me. Um, where, G, uh, where you are, the Holy Spirit comes. Where you are, heaven shines. Um, you are the gate to heaven, and my heaven is your son. Take me, take me into your womb um, so that I can shine Jesus like you do. Um, and then if I were to die, Jesus would live in me. If I were to die, I would be able to radiate his love, right? Um, and I would rest. Come, come quickly, my death. I want to die so I can live. And then it's pray for me, Mary, that your son would live in me. Um, where you are, the Holy Spirit comes. And where you are, heaven comes, right? So it's very beautiful. So we'll sing that song and then we'll go on. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in us the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and we will be recreated and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Sorry.
with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady of Chastahava, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh, I have all sorts of stories to tell you. This will be a podcast of stories, right? And I could have collected pictures of each one of these people to share with you as I spoke. But then I wouldn't get this recorded till next week. Because <laughs> I'd have to find them and gather them together. Half of them are in my house, but I thought we're just going to go forward. <laughs> if I don't keep going forward, then I go backwards. So we're going to talk about some of the different Polish saints. And one of the first ones I want to talk about is um, St. Stanislaus. St. Stanislaus is known um, to have been um, a very holy um, Polish soul. And you, a lot of times when you meet um, Polish people, their names are Stanislaus, right? Just kind of like St. Kashmir. They're some of the old Polish saints. And um, both St. Stanislaus and St. Kashmir come from around the area of um, Krakow, I believe. And St. Stanislaus was um, a layman who really loved God and was persecuted greatly for his faith. Um, by the nobility, and then eventually he became a priest, and he was very faithful in what he taught, and he eventually was killed um, for preaching the gospel. And there also is St. Kashmir, like I was talking about, and he was a um, king, or born into a noble family, let's say, maybe not a king, um, but of great nobility, and he tried to live the faith in a very um, holy way, even when persecuted by his own family and by the people around him. And um, he left the Polish people um, an example of one who always mortified himself and sacrificed himself in order to serve the poor and those that were around him in greatest need. Um, he used his authority in the ch in the church and in the government um, truly for the good of other people. 
Um, there also is St. Adalbert. Some of these older ones I'm going to go through more quickly. And St. Adalbert is known all over the world. And um, he was born, if I remember correctly, it's closer to like the German border that was more Bavarian, right? And um, he, you know, climbed the hierarchy of the church and he also was eventually put to death for his faith. Um, but he was a very holy man who also had a great love for the poor. And St. Stanislaus, St. Kashmir, St. Adelbert, these are three very strong witnesses um, to what it means to be um, Polish and what it means to be Catholic. And all three of them use the power and the authority entrusted to them by God solely for the good of others. And they were all three willing to put their life at risk, put their reputation at risk um, in order to spread the gospel. And they're kind of pillars of the Catholic faith in Poland. Um, and I would kind of put in their category, St. Hedwig. I don't know if you know much about St. Hedwig. She was um, actually born in a different country. Um, I'm thinking it was like Czech or somewhere kind of, you know, in the Southern area. And um, she married a Polish nobleman whose name I believe was Henry. And they had several children and she used her position as a queen in a palace um, to take care of the poor. And she ruled very wisely. And towards the end of her life, she retired to one of their castles in Pszebnica, which is um, very close to Wrocław, where I spent years and years um, when I was in the missions with my friends, kind of coming back and forth with some family, some religious sisters. And some of the sisters I knew live in that, um, it's now like a convent, but it was like the castle, the, um, the monastery of, in Pszebnica, where um, St. Hedwig withdrew. And, um, you know, her heart was um, really broken by the divisions between her children. Um, there's nothing that can harm a woman's heart more than when they're in love with God and they see the children that they've born or the people around them who they love divided and fighting. And that happened to St. Hedwig. Um, but she had a very staunch faith in, faith in God and um, a really rich prayer life. Um, so I would kind of put her with St. Stanislaus and St. Adelbert and St. Kashmir as, you know, and St. Hedwig as these old pillars of the Catholic faith. Um, and people who used their position in their country in order to um, spread the gospel and to help those who were least fortunate and who never let their position get to their head, who remained faithful to the teachings of the church. Um, there's another less known bishop, Bishop um, Andrew Baola, Be 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 I think, Babola, maybe. Um, and he also used his position in the church to really help and to serve the poor, and many miracles were attributed to him. So these are kind of, you know, the, um, the antique figures of Polish saints. Um, that all Poles revere, right? And yet in our more modern times, the Lord has raised up um, Polish saints who have found um, a great admiration among all the people all over the world. Um, those who love and follow their teachings um, are not reserved just to the Polish people. And I think they came forth from this rich, um, foundation of their forefathers, you know, of, of saints like Stanislaus and Adalbert and Hedwig and Kashmir and Andrew Babola, I think is his name. Um, one of these, a little bit more modern, is St. Stanislaus Kostka. Sometimes people mix him up with St. Stanislaus. St. Stanislaus um, was a priest and he um, he eventually was killed for the faith. St. Stanislaus Kostka was a Jesuit novice. So he wasn't even ordained a priest, but he was known among the Jesuits um, 
even before he was ordained, um, as being an exemplary um, person when it came to holiness. A holiness would just radiate off of him, and especially for purity. And he's oftentimes um, evoked by the youth as a special intercessor, right? Because he found um, holiness not, you know, in the middle age of life or at the end of life after much study and problems and all of this. He, in the freshness of his youth, embraced the gospel in such a powerful way, almost that his life on earth got snuffed out. He became ill, he foretold the day of his death, and he died. Um, a young witness, a young um, martyr to prayerful love, um, often, you know, compared to somebody like Therese of Lisieux, who loved the Lord so much, she became ill at a young age and died. Um, St. Stanislaus Kostka, is also one of those saints and um, seminarians from all over the world and young people involved with youth ministry really should turn to him and cling to him for, as an example. Um, and then we have, you know, the greatest saints of the 20th century, several of whom came from Poland. And I am proud to say they are somehow of my bloodline, of my relatives, right? And these are saints who really shook the whole earth and um, touched the whole world. And there's a few of them that I'll name that um, still, you know, their time of being known the most hasn't come. Um, that still have a, uh, a mission in the world to change it. And it hasn't um, ignited quite yet, but I'm sure that... Um, their way to canonization that they're on right now will be as prophetic as, you know, John Paul II and St. Faustina, who we'll talk about, St. Edith Stein, um, Cardinal Vyshinsky, Maximilian Kolbe. So those are the ones of the modern um, 20th century that I'd like to talk about. Um, St. Maximilian Kolbe, let's talk about him. He was a Franciscan and he when he was very little, um, he had a vision of Our Lady where she offered him a red crown or a white crown and said, which one do you want? The red was the crown of martyrdom and the white was that of purity. And with all the gusto that a child can have, he said, I want both, right? And he was surely granted both. He entered the Franciscans and, um, and received that crown of purity, you know, a life consecrated totally and only to God. And, um, then he was crowned with the red crown of martyrdom um, during World War II in Auschwitz when he gave his life for another prisoner. And, you know, in between that, entering the, the Franciscans and his death in Auschwitz, Maximilian Kolbe did more than, you know, almost any saint in the history of the church to spread the message um, of love and consecration and trust in Our Lady's protection. And I'm sure a lot of that came from his own devotion to Our Lady of Czesława. You have to know, like, when you visit Poland, it's almost like visiting a huge garden to Our Lady. On every roadside of every village and of every town, there's a shrine to Our Lady. In every church, there's processions and there's special novenas and prayers said every day to Our Lady. You know, every evening there's babushkas who um, pray that rosary with their children and their grandchildren um, in the quiet corners of their house. And um, every year people make major pilgrimages, especially for the feast of Our Lady of Chastahava on August 26th to Chastahava on foot from anywhere that they live in the country of Poland, they walk. And so if they live close, they leave a day before. And if they live far, they leave a week before. But the whole country meets at Chastahava for her feast day. That kind of a devotion and a love to Our Lady was in the blood of Maximilian Kolbe. And I'm sure having a vision of her when he was little, you know, also um, really rooted him in that maternal relationship with her. And so as he grew up, he, um, and within the Franciscan order, he felt a greater and a greater fire to spread the message of Our Lady. And he called her the Immaculata, right? The Immaculata. And he took a lot of his 
writing from um, her apparition in Fatima, right? Where she said, you know, I am, um, you know, coming to convert the whole world. And I, you know, to pray for the conversion of Russia, the triumph of the Immaculate Heart. Um, he took a lot of his writing from Bernadette and Lourdes where Our Lady said, I am the Immaculate Conception. Um, and he called her his Immaculata. And he began these groups of, these prayer groups called the Knights of Immaculata, um, who would fight as warriors for the honor of their mother and who would put themselves at her service to be soldiers against Satan in the world. And they would do this through littleness. And there's a lot of his writing on what it means to be a true child of Mary and a knight of, of Our Lady. And he took a lot from the writing of St. Louis de Montfort, who also had a similar mission to spread devotion and consecration to Our Lady. And uh, he started the Knights of the Immaculata. And then he started these little cities of the Immaculata, he would call it. Um, Mi Pakolanov was the first one in in Poland and, um, you know, the city of Mary. And, and then when he went to Japan, he started the Garden of Mary. And um, he want, these were places of, uh, that were centers of Marian devotion. And he started a, um, a magazine and a newspaper um, that would teach the doctrines of Our Lady and um, spread um, the spirituality of being her child throughout the world. And the Franciscans didn't have money. He'd have to raise the money to print and distribute these himself, but he did. And he did it in many languages. And he had a very powerful missionary um, heart that spread out throughout the entire world. He went to Japan for a while. He founded, you know, found translators and learned the language. And he founded the Garden of the Immaculate there. Um, and he ended up coming back to Poland and um, being arrested. He could have avoided it, but he didn't. Um, and put in Auschwitz. And one day there was a prisoner who escaped. And um, in punishment for that, they would just randomly select 10 prisoners to be executed in the starvation bunk. And um, one of the men that was selected cried out, my wife, my child, I cannot die. You cannot do this. And Maximilian Colby knew it was time to fulfill that, that red crown that Our Lady offered to him. And he courageously stepped forward to the soldiers, which he never did, and said, I would like to, um, to take the place of that man. And there was a power that came from him, and they couldn't deny that request. Um, and I think they even asked him something like, you must be a Polish priest or something. And he said, yes, I am. And they did it. They exchanged it. Um, and Maximilian Colby led his group to the starvation bunker. And I've been there in Auschwitz and I've prayed in that bunker where he died. And, um, you know, you'd think a place like that would be full of um, sorrow and evil. And yet I feel so much hope, um, from that witness and the blood of the martyrs that's in that place. Um, you know, his faith, knowing that he wasn't created for this world, that the Immaculata who he served on earth was calling him to serve her fully in heaven. And St. Maximilian Colby gave his life. Um, they, he was always encouraging his fellow prisoners to sing and to pray. And then after about 10 days, um, he still hadn't died when most of the rest of the group had. And so the soldiers entered and um, gave him a shot of poison to kill him. And because of that, he's actually the patron saint of drug addicts, ironically. Um, and because he was killed by drugs. Um, but what, you know, he, he used to say things like, um, you know, I, I, my one goal in life is to still suffer more um, because to suffer is to love. And that those weren't just words of his. Um, he followed Our Lady as the Our Lady of Sorrows, right? And if you look at um, Our Lady of Chesterhova, she has two cuts on the right side of her cheek. And it's because the soldiers came in one day and attacked her image and cut it. But they've left it there because it's an image that Our Lady who loves is, an Our, is a blessed mother who also suffers with her people. And Maximilian Colby looked to that woman 
um, to be his strength. And because of that, he's a radiant example um, of what we can do in the world. And we turn to him kind of as our patron um, in our ministry of books and of broadcasting and things like that throughout the world because um, he liked to use the most modern of technologies to spread the gospel um, of Jesus and a love and a devotion to the Immaculata. So that's our Maximilian Colby. And um, at a similar time to him is St. Edith Stein. And I've, I've done many podcasts, including her writing. And it, she was from Breslau, which is Wrocław, where I used to live and visit in Poland. But during the time um, of her birth and when she was raised, it was under German occupation. So they called it Breslau. But I've been to that house there, and she was born into a very Jewish family, um, very faithful Jewish family, and she was a brilliant woman. And she excelled in academics and philosophy and became well-known. And, and one day, she had some good Catholic friends, and I believe they were in Germany, and um, uh, the husband died. And she was taken aback by the courage and the peace and the love of the wife in the face of her husband's death. And she wanted to know what made that woman be able to embrace suffering that way. And, and she shared the faith with her and her belief that her husband was in heaven and that she, Jesus would also help her join him there someday. And, and it ignited an interest within the Catholic Church. And she was intellectually honest. And so um, she sought out the teachings of the church and eventually wanted to convert. She didn't want to tell her mom because it would break her Jewish heart. Um, but she was eventually baptized and then um, gave up a great position of prestige as um, a well-known and respected woman philosopher in Europe um, to join the Carmelites. And she wanted to give her whole life um, to prayer with Christ and um, when Germany started to take over during World War II, um, they began to follow and kind of come after her. Yes, because she was a Catholic sister, but more because of her Jewish roots. And she knew that she would have to suffer for her Jewish people to bring them to the faith in the midst of such travesty. And she was willing to do that. And um, the sisters did move her to the Netherlands um, with her sister, uh, Rosa, and um, who lived kind of as a housekeeper. And um, then there was a chance for her to escape to like Austria, but her sister didn't have a visa and she wouldn't leave her sister, her blood sister. And eventually the Nazis found and arrested them in the Netherlands and, and sent them back to Poland. And immediately upon arrival at Auschwitz, she was killed. And she has some really profound writing that I have drawn deeply from both in my personal spiritual life and in the writing that I've done on women and things. But um, her writing on suffering is something that she lived with her blood eventually. And um, oh, my favorite work of hers, um, which had to do with St. John of the Cross and living you know, in union with Jesus crucified, she wrote right before she was arrested, when they sent her to the Netherlands, the sisters wanted to keep her busy and keep her mind off of everything going on. And they asked her to write this work on the cross. And she did. And it's incredibly beautiful, incredibly powerful. And she writes about the whole world being on fire and being crucified and how the human heart has a desire to put out these flames and, and how can you serve from a convent far away? But it's through prayer and how through this ministry of prayer, you can um, you know, be that doctor on the battlefront healing the wounds of people just through prayer, that you can you know, support the orphans, that you can um, you know, comfort the soldiers and um, she talks about how it's only by faithfulness to Jesus crucified that the war would be stopped and suffering would be annihilated. And, you know, she used to say, you know, he hangs on the cross before you. Will you deny him? Will you deny his request that you be with him? 
um, their suffering. And she didn't deny his request. She was faithful to him, to the cross, to Auschwitz and beyond. Um, and we turn to her today too. And although sometimes, sometimes the Germans claim her, but she actually did live in Poland in Wrocław. And, um, and I like to claim her as one of our own. So we ask St. Edith Stein to pray for us, right? There were so many martyrs of Auschwitz. Um, I've got books and books on them. And um, maybe sometime I'll, I'll kind of go through some of the more obscure ones. But the one thing that they had in common was an undying love for Jesus that showed great courage and peace and hope and joy even in the midst of the cross, right? Um, we remember some of those Carmelites I've gone through who've died during World War II. And um, not all of them were Polish, but um, it's an incredible depth of spirituality that's faithful even unto and through death, um, radiating a joy and a love and a peace and a hope in the midst of a death camp, right? And um, we ask the intercession of all of these. There's another um, family from that time that I want to mention. It's the Ulma family, Yosef and Victoria Ulma, and U-L-M-A, Ulma. And uh, right now they are up for beatification in Poland along with their six or seven children. Um, and it's so beautiful. Uh, they were married and they had these six small children under the age of um, eight, although she was expecting a baby. And supposedly when she was killed, she gave birth to that baby. So they want to beatify that unborn baby too. And um, they were willing to take in and to hide Jewish families who were in danger because they knew that what was being done to them was unjust. And... Um, Eventually, the Nazi police came and found Yosef and Victoria and shot them. And their six young children were watching and crying. And because they were screaming and crying, the Nazis turned and martyred them for their faith as well. Their faith in God that um, convicted them to hide the Jews and to trust in his love and to live the gospel heroically, even at the threat of their own life. And um, they said that while the massacre happened, Victoria went into labor with her seventh baby and that at the end they found that unborn baby laying next to her in the field. Um, so they want to beatify not only Yosef and Victoria Uma, who we ask their intercession, but little Stanislava, Stanislava, who was age eight, Barbara, who was age seven, Vuitz, um, Vladislav, who was six, Franciszek, who was four, Antony, who was three, Maria, who was two, and then their unborn baby. So we ask these heroic Polish saints, the Ulma family, to pray for us, to um, ignite our love, to be focused on what is eternal, and to help us with our work in Poland and in families, right? And then, of course, I can't talk about um, Poland um, without talking about St. Faustina, right? And her message is spread throughout the whole world, that message of divine mercy, where she was um, a young sister and she joined the um, Congregation of Divine Mercy outside of Krakow. And Jesus appeared to her and spoke to her and gave her a beautiful image of his divine mercy um, that um, had some blood and water coming out of his heart as a fountain of mercy for us and taught her the chaplet of divine mercy, which many of us pray daily and requested for a novena of divine mercy um, starting in good, a good Friday every year and ending the Sunday after Easter. And then that feast on that Sunday of divine mercy, which is a new feast for the church and this gift of divine mercy that was given to Faustina for the world wasn't given without a price. She was kind of unknown and poo-pooed and had a great lot of suffering in her short convent life. She died very young, um, I believe like around 35. Um, but 
she, um, you know, it was reiterated to her the importance of that message of mercy to our world because, you know, such grave sins entered into the world in the 20th century and we see them even more so in the 21st. Not only all the wars and concentration camps and bombs, the promiscuity, the abortions, and now we look at um, uh, issues of homosexuality and, and, um, and the slaughter of, of God's design for marriage. Um, and those are just some big things. Um, think of all the little sins that have entered in. And so the message that the Lord came to give us was not one of justice, one of threats, but one of his mercy, of his love, and how no one should be afraid to come to him and to trust in his mercy and love. No matter what it is that you've done um, in the world, it's never too much to be washed away by his divine mercy, that love, that blood and water that came forth from his heart. And that simple phrase that St. Faustina taught us to pray often is powerful um, in today's world. Jesus, I trust in you, right? Jesus, ufam topia. And it's written on the image that she had spread throughout the world, but it also should be even more so written as like the heartbeat of our heart. Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you. Um, to the degree that a soul trusts in the Lord is a degree that he can help them, that he can be present in their lives. Um, and so that's the message of Saint Faustina, um, is that great, powerful message of mercy for the world. And it came through Poland, right? Um, you know, all through this time of communism, Poland was the only country that didn't lose their faith, that actually grew in their faith during communist um, occupation. And a lot of that had to do with actually the next one we'll talk about, Blessed Cardinal Stefan Wyszynski. And he was a young, um, a young priest when he was made um, a archbishop and then the cardinal and the primate of Poland. I think he was like 43 if I remember right. Um, and he was a, a very holy man, a very devout man and a very prudent man. And, um, he had to learn how to deal with the Nazi and the Russian then authorities in a way that didn't provoke more um, damage to the people and yet which inspired a faith in the people that the authorities couldn't squelch with atheism, right, with communism. And, you know, he was said to have said um, the Polish people have shown that they can be martyrs. Now they need to show that they can live the faith in the midst of an occupation. So he didn't want, you know, the people just to all line up and be killed for no reason. Um, he wanted to be savvy enough to, to inspire a faith, solid enough to not be influenced by the evil around them, and yet not provoking greater evil. And he did it. He, um, he really gathered the people together, and he was such a threat to the government, they forbid him to travel, they... Um, they had, you know, dozens and dozens of Secret Service people that would monitor every move and every conversation and everything that he ever said publicly or privately, you know. A lot of times he and John Paul II, too, had their confessionals um, that were miked so that they would hear, you know, what they were saying to people, even at that point, you know, in the seal of confession. And eventually they were really threatened by Vyshinsky and they... Um, they had arrested some of the priests, falsely accused them and put them in prison, but they wouldn't do that to him. They just took control and put him under house arrest for three years. And they thought that that would cut him from the people and um, he'd have no power and then they could overtake the heart of the Polish people for communism. But it kind of worked in um, a backwards way, it backfired because he spent those three years praying and planning out what he would do when he got out. And he knew that in 1966, Poland would um, celebrate the thousandth anniversary of the faith coming to Poland. It was their 1,000th anniversary of the baptism of Poland, right, into Christianity. So he wanted to spend those 10 years at least beforehand from 1956 to 1966. 
um, preparing the people and recatechizing the country, and he did it brilliantly. So while he was in prison, he wrote this beautiful consecration prayer of the country as the primate of Poland to Our Lady of Czestochowa. And at the end of this podcast, I'm going to read that prayer as our closing prayer. It's so beautiful. And um, while he was in prison here, he sent this prayer to the other hierarchy of Poland and asked that it be read um, in Czestochowa. And they gathered together like a million people and they read it and they prayed that prayer, reconsecrating the country to her. And all of a sudden the people started to chant, Mary, our mother, come to us, come to us, come to us. And um, the priest that was in charge of the shrine of Czestochowa contacted Cardinal Kwasinski and told him that. The people were chanting, mother, come, mother, come. And it inspired another idea. Um, and he said, well, then let the icon go to the people. And he organized that this icon that had been in, you know, in Chastahava, in Yajnagora for like 700 years or 800 years, I forget exactly when it came, um, leave and go on a procession around the country for 10 years to every parish, to every shrine, and that there be processions and devotions done in honor of Our Lady, asking her to keep the Polish people close to her son, right, for 10 years. And after three and a f or four years, I mean, this was completely reviving the country. Um, the communists got really annoyed because it was everything was backfiring. So they sent um, all of these uh, secret service and um, these police cars to stop the procession of the icon, and they arrested Our Lady of Chelsea They arrested the icon. They took her. And then they put her under house arrest at the cathedral in Krakow. And they said that the image wasn't allowed to leave the, the um, cathedral in Krakow. And then after about a year or two, I think it was, um, they sent her back to Yajnagora in Chastahova and they said the icon can never leave here again. So, you know, they arrested the painting and yet the people's faith was not in the painting itself. It was the idea of Our Lady who conquers all evil, even communist evil. And so Cardinal Wyszynski said, well, we weren't honoring the actual image, right? Um, we were honoring Our Lady and it's our love of Our Lady and our devotion to her, our trust in her, our prayer to her is beyond something temporal. So he took the frame that Our Lady of Chastahova was in, just kind of as a symbol that God is greater than the evil that the communists can do. And he sent the frame around the country for the rest of the 10 years. And people would gather and do processions and all of that, knowing they were connected, excuse me, through this one image of Our Lady that was like a symbol of the Polish faith in um, Our Lady and her role, you know, primarily um, that was like her role to John under the cross and Mary Magdalene, where Jesus said to, you know, Mary that she was to be our mother. And she, he said, you know, John, this is your mother. Mother, this is your son. And each one of us can put ourselves under the cross. And when Jesus was taken up into heaven, he left the apostles, the disciples, the women in the care of Our Lady. And so we're not obviously worshiping Our Lady or especially just in a picture, but the picture reminds us of her, just like the photo of anyone we love reminds us of that person. And um, it's that remembrance of her that, you know, ignites our faith more in her presence that's with us beyond time and space and canvas. Um, and it's a presence that uh, protected many during the time of Nazism and the wars and communism and strengthened even these who we honor who were killed for their faith. Um, it was Our Lady standing at the foot of their cross. And we see that with Chastahava. It's really, really beautiful. Cardinal Vyshinsky had the courage to um, ordain John Paul II as a bishop only at age 38. 
And the communists decided that this dynamic re leader, Carol Wojtyla, um, would be best divided from the, um, Vyshinsky. So they gave him permission to travel throughout the world and they pretended like they really liked him, um, trying to divide the two of them. And Cardinal, or um, Carol Wojtyla, John Paul II, made sure he never publicly said a thing against whatever Cardinal Vyshinsky would say. He knew that united we stand, divided we fall. And um, eventually the, you know, Archbishop of Krakow was sent to Rome and elected Pope John Paul II. And he had such a dynamic effect on the coming down of communism and um, the renewal of the faith in Poland. It said even when he went back to Poland as a Pope, Cardinal Wyszynski was so protective that nothing would happen to him and followed him like this mama hen. And when he introduced him at you know the main meeting when Pope John Paul II got up, um, instead of drawing attention to himself, he said, I have one thing to say, long live Cardinal Wyszynski, long live, and all the people were chanting for him. Why? Because he was such a witness of the faith and a stronghold, a stoic, you know, silent strength in the midst of communism that said, um, you know, we will not fall and you will not conquer. And, you know, all the historians say if there was no Cardinal Vyshinsky, there would have been no Kirill Wojtyla, John Paul II. And John Paul II had great suffering in his own life. You know, his mom died when he was young. His older brother, who he loved, died. Eventually, his dad died. Um, and he found himself an orphan in this world. And during the war, he had to make a decision, do I go and fight with the resistance or become a priest? And um, he was talking to a friend of his, a tailor, who was very into the Carmelites and, and introduced John Paul II to Carmelite spirituality. His name was Jan Tiranovsky. And he said, you know, um, when this evil of communism, of Nazism falls, um, it will just come back under another name. Because when evil is conquered, it just tries to come back under another name. Um, but if you have love present, then it can be destroyed forever, right? If you have love, take its place. So John Paul II saw that as a call to the priesthood and to embracing a life of prayer and love as opposed to just fighting the evil because the evil could be conquered and then it would come back. But if he spent his energy in a life of deep spirituality, of prayer and of love, um, of service in the church, then maybe communism would be conquered forever. And it, you know, it really was destroyed, um, much to do with the hand and the heart of John Paul II in the papacy, right? And, you know, his life also didn't come without suffering once he was made Pope, that, you know, on May 13th, the Feast of Our Lady of Fatima, um, you know, some of these terrorists came and shot Pope John Paul II. And, he was um, in the hospital, Gemelli Hospital in Italy, and word came to Cardinal Wyszynski, who was on his deathbed in Poland, and he called him. He called his, his spiritual son, the Pope, and um, he said, I always worried they would get to you and that they would do this. And um, they really shared some tender moments there right at the end of the Cardinal's life. And, um, and John Paul II went on to change the world. He changed the world through you know, the beginning of his papal address, the first one he gave, which was, be not afraid, open the doors to Christ. Be not afraid, right? And I'll tell you, having lived in Russia when communism supposedly fell and hadn't yet, and then going to visit Poland and living with the Polish people, I learned how to not be afraid in Russia from my Polish friends because they had learned from John Paul II. Don't be afraid. Don't be intimidated by this big monster of evil, right? Put your, your faith in Christ and know that, um, you know, when we are with him, we're unconquerable, right? And um, it's just really beautiful. And John Paul II also gave the world the theology of the body, um, which was so prophetic to the evils that would come here in this 21st century of, you know, increased abortion and um, a lack of um, euthanasia, a lack of respect for life, and even the distortions in marriage, right? Um, where things are so inverted and so diabolical, right? Um, divided. 
And his theology of the body is a medicine for all of that, for all those errors of this age. And we'll only see that open up all the more. And so that's why he was a great saint for our times, right? He had a great way of uniting people. Um, and so these are just some of the examples of the greatness that Poland has offered us, especially in the last, you know, 150 years or 200 years. Um, Poland has offered the world such fresh water um, that could only come from that Immaculate Heart of Our Lady. And it's because these people found their refuge in her Immaculate Heart. When we find rest in the Immaculate Heart of Mary, we absorb that purity and that love, that humility into ourselves, and we become more immaculate. We become more holy. Um, the more we allow her love to penetrate us. You know, every parent leaves an imprint on their child. You, you know, there's no child you meet who doesn't say something like their mom would say it or look at something. And the mom doesn't say, you know, you have to repeat me or you have to, you know, sometimes it's just like an expression on their face. Children just pick up the way their mother is. And that's how what we're called to do with Our Lady and Our Lady of Chastahava. When we lean upon Our Lady as the Immaculate Love, then we become that fresh water for the world like these Polish saints were. And Jesus is entrusting these difficult times to us. He's trying to raise up heroic saints that were beyond even what came before us. And the main instruments that he's given to us to do that have come from Poland. The theology of the body with John Paul II. You know, courage in the face of communist murderous evil in the concentration camps, right? You know, what Cardinal Wyszynski went through, what John Paul II went through, Maximilian Kolbe, Edith Stein, and um, the Ulma family, right? There's, he's calling us to look at that transcendent beauty and holiness and hope that heaven gives us no matter what we encounter. And because of our closeness to his mother, the Immaculate Mother of Mercy, um, we're able to really embrace that message given to St. Faustina, which was a message of trust in Jesus and his merciful love. And that not only are we supposed to trust him with our own lives and our own needs, but we need to become instruments of his mercy for others so that others are drawn to trust God because of us. So it's really, really beautiful. I think a lot of this fruit has come from prayers to Our Lady, especially under the title of Our Lady of Chastahava. And here at the end, I want to read this long prayer it's called The Pledge or the Vows of Yajna Gora, written by Cardinal Wyszynski when he was in prison. And um, being Polish, I can identify deeply with it. But even if you're of a Germanic, a French, and Hispanic descent, you can enter your own um, identity into this. You can change it. So it says, you know, the Polish people, you could say the Mexican people. It's a beautiful way for us to consecrate ourselves again into the embrace of our Immaculate Mother of love and of mercy. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. O great Mother of God and man, the Virgin who gave birth to God, Mary who was praised by God, the Queen of the world and the Queen of Poland. Since three centuries have passed, since that joyous day when you became the Queen of Poland. We, the children of the Polish nation and your children of the same bloodline as our ancestors, stand once again before you, full of those same feelings of love, faithfulness, and hope that once enlivened our fathers. We, the Polish bishops and the royal clergy, a people saved by the saving blood of your son, come, Mary, again to your throne, O great mediator of grace, mother of mercy and of all consolation. We bring to your immaculate feet all the centuries of our faithfulness to God and the Church of Christ, the centuries of faithfulness to the lofty mission of the nation, washed in the water of holy baptism. 
We place at your feet ourselves and everything that we have, our families, houses of worship, homes, fields, workplaces, plows, hammers, and pens. All of our efforts, our beating hearts, and our bursts of will. We stand before you full of gratitude that you have been our virgin of assistance at times of glory and at the many times of disaster. We stand before you full of repentance with a sense of guilt for not yet fulfilling the pledges and promises of our fathers. Look upon us, O kind lady, with the eye of your mercy and hear the mighty voices which go out to you in a harmonious chorus from the depths of the hearts of many millions of those from the people of God who have been given over to you. O Queen of Poland, we renew today the pledge of our ancestors to you as our patron, and we recognize you as the Queen of the Polish nation. Both ourselves and all the Polish lands and all the people we commend to your special protection and defense. We humbly call for your help and mercy in the struggle to remain faithful to God, the cross and the gospels, the Holy Church and its shepherds, our Holy Fatherland, which is the advance guard of Christianity, dedicated to your immaculate heart and the heart of your son. Remember, Virgin Mother, when the presence of God and the nation that was given to you which wants to remain your kingdom under the protection of the greatest father of all the nations of earth. We promise to do everything in our power so that Poland will truly be your kingdom and your son's kingdom, given over entirely to your rule in our personal, family, national, and social lives. Queen of Poland, we so pledge. O Mother of Divine Grace, we pledge to you to protect the gift of grace, which is the source of divine life in every Polish heart. We hope that every one of us will live in sanctifying grace and be a temple of God, that the entire nation will live without mortal sin, and that it will become a house of God and a gate of heaven for the generations passing across the Polish lands under the leadership of the Catholic Church to the eternal fatherland. Queen of Poland, we so pledge. O Holy Mother of God, Mother of good advice, we pledge to you with eyes focused on the manger of Bethlehem that henceforth we will all defend the unborn life. We will fight to defend every child and every cradle as courageously as our fathers fought for the existence and freedom of the nation, paying with their own blood. We are ready to die rather than kill a single defenseless one. We consider the gift of life to be the greatest grace of the father of all life and is the most valuable treasure of the nation. Queen of Poland, we so pledge. O mother of Christ and house of gold, we pledge to you to defend the permanence of marriage, to protect the dignity of women, to guard the domestic hearth, so that within it the lives of Poles will be saved. We pledge to you to strengthen the reign of your son Jesus Christ in the family, to protect the honor of the name of God, to implant in the hearts and minds of children the spirit of the Gospels and love towards you, to guard the laws of God and Christians and national traditions, we pledge to you to raise the young generations in faithfulness to Christ, to defend them against godlessness and depravity, and surround them with watchful parental protection. Queen of Poland, we so pledge. Mirror of justice, listening closely to the eternal longings of the nation, we pledge to you to walk in the light of justice in Christ our Lord. We promise to work hard so that in our fatherland, all children of the nation will live in love and justice and harmony and peace, so that among us there will be no hatred, violence, or exploitation. We promise to share among ourselves willingly the harvests of the earth, 
the fruits of labor. So under the common roof of our house, there will no longer be hunger, homelessness, weeping, or division. Queen of Poland, we so pledge. O victorious lady of Yajna Gora, we promise to fight under your banner a most holy and most difficult struggle with our national defects. We promise to declare war on laziness and recklessness, wastefulness, drunkenness, and promiscuity. We promise to attain the virtues of faithfulness and conscientiousness, hard work and frugality, self-denial and mutual respect, love, and social justice. Queen of Poland, we so pledge. O Queen of Poland, we renew the pledge of our fathers and promise that we will diligently strengthen and spread in our hearts and in the Polish lands your honor and the worship of you, Mother of God, who is praised in so many of our houses of worship, particularly in your capital of Yashnagora. We give over to you in this particular act of love every Polish home and every Polish heart so that we will never cease to speak of your glory on any day, particularly on your holy days. We pledge to walk in the path of your virtue, virgin mother and faithful lady, and with your help to fulfill our pledges. Queen of Poland, we so pledge. In fulfilling these pledges, we see a living vote of the nation more precious to you than granite and bronze. Let them commit us to a worthy preparation of our thousand year anniversary of the baptism, sorry, a worthy preparation of our hearts for the thousandth year anniversary of Polish Christianity. On the eve of the thousandth year anniversary of the baptism of our nation, we want to remember that you first sang to the nation the hem of liberation from slavery and sin that you first stood in defense of the little children and those who hungered and showed the world the light of justice of Christ and of our God. We want to remember that you are the mother of our way, truth, and life, that in your maternal face, we will most surely recognize your son, to whom you unfailingly point the way. Accept our pledge, strengthen it, strengthen it in our hearts, and place it before God in the one holy trinity. In your hands we place our past and future, all our national and social life, the church of your son, and everything that's precious to us in God. Lead us through the land of Poland, which is given over to you, to the gates of the heavenly fatherland, and at the threshold of the new life, show us Jesus, the blessed fruit of your womb. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Alleluia, 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 Our Lady of Chastahava. Pray for us.